Okay, we're in business. Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for starting a few minutes late here. We had some technical issues on this end. I'm Steve Pakin, and as you know, every couple of weeks we do this to give you a chance to ask questions to people who are involved with provincial politics here in the province of Ontario. And uh, we have two of the better guys here today to tackle that. Beside me here is John McIntyre. John is the president of the Bradgate Research Group, one of the founding members of Mike Harris's Common Sense Revolution, going back to 1994 when the revolution started, and then 95, of course, when Mr. Harris won his first of two consecutive majorities. And joining us on the line now from uh, London, UK, is Jamie Heath. Uh, Jamie was communications director for the federal NDP when Jack Layton was the leader there. He's also the author of Dead Center, Hope, Possibility, and Unity for Canadian Progressives. And Jamie, it's good to see you again. You're, you're now living over there, eh? Uh, yeah, I'm doing my best not to be involved in Ontario politics, but uh, here I am. Nice to see you, Steve. Indeed. Okay, well, let's start with this. John, um, uh, looking at the scene here in the province of Ontario, and obviously those of you who are following along here, feel free to uh, keyboard your questions in and we'll get to them as soon as uh, we've got a couple in the queue here to go. Uh, the New Democrats right now are making a decision about whether or not they want to support Kathleen Wynne and Charles Sousa's first budget. And I wonder if you could give us a sense of what kind of conversations they're having are happening behind the scenes among New Democrats which will help them decide yes we should support it or no we should bring this government down. It, it really becomes a question of uh, long-term gain, short-term pain. Um, it, the calculus for each of the leaders is very very different but for her uh, I think she's got the, of the three leaders she has the most to gain. This is Horvath we're talking about? Henry Horvath. Okay. By waiting. Although I think it would be a stellar, memorable moment for her, she has a, uh, having been given everything and more than she asked for, she could absolutely, so there's a case for her going out and in total uh, credibility, uh, declaring that the most important thing that she asked for wasn't there, which was a balanced uh, request. She didn't want every, she didn't want to raise taxes, she wanted to raise debt or deficit, she wanted to have it balanced and with where where she wanted to get the money from wasn't given to her. The Liberals instead decided to be the most left-wing party in the province and it would be hilarious to have her basically declare herself a fiscal response, sorry, a fiscal conservative to defeat the government because she didn't get that part of what she asked for. Okay, interesting. Jane, but yeah. but mm -hmm. then she only gained a few seats in the spring election. I think she has potentially the most, well, the most to gain going from third potentially first because she's not there yet. So more time would benefit her, I think, absolutely the most. The fear, of course, is that more time will also benefit Kathleen Wynne. You're further away from prorogan, further away from gas plant scandals, further away from any health and orange. Absolutely. So that's part of the calculation they have to make, part of the balance. Yeah. Okay. Jamie, just let us in. I mean, you've actually been there in these kinds of conversations when uh, Jack Layton was the leader federally and that's right. it was a minority parliament and you guys had to figure out do we support this budget? Do we not support? Let us in on your thinking on this. Well, I mean, I, I partly agree with John, but it's also sort of between a rock and a hard place. I think, you know, minority parliaments in, in Canada in particular, they're sort of this rolling uh, stone of one-off events. Are you going to support them on the throne speech or on the budget or on a confidence test? And you don't have the, the situation that's in place, say, here in Britain or in, in other Commonwealth countries, where if a minority government is elected, for the most part, it's elected for the term. And so you're lumped with either, you know, this the, the charge of triggering a so-called early election, or you are lumped with propping up a government that you say on a whole bunch of issues is failing. And it's a very difficult dynamic. I mean, I, I agree with some of what, what John said in terms of what would be going on inside the caucus, but the caucus wouldn't be united, for example. So. You know, if Kathleen Wynne is popular in Toronto, but is less popular in perhaps Northern Ontario or the Southwest, then the regional dynamics will, will also be playing themselves out. And it's a very difficult uh, difficult situation for Andrea Horvath. It's much easier if you did what Stephen Harper did with Paul Martin or what Tim Hudak is doing now at Queen's Park and just wash your hands of any sort of responsibility for actually making the Parliament work, which is the difficult part. Jamie, just to follow up on that, Andrea Horvath obviously is the first female leader of her party. Kathleen Wynne is the second female leader of her party, but the first female premier we've had since 1867. 
Do you think that as a part of the NDP's deliberations, they are asking themselves, can we really pull the plug after just three months on the first female premier ever? I, I don't know the answer to that question, to be fair. But, and I think to some extent, I mean, I, I understand why you're asking that question, and I think it's a fair question. I think to some extent the, the gender of the premier or the leader is somewhat irrelevant. Irrespective of who the NDP leader is, whether it was Andrew Horvath or whether it was Jack Clayton, the two most recent examples in minority parliament, one core part of the NDP's brand has been that we will get results and that we will get something done. And so it's this constant balancing act between your, your natural partisan um, sort of goals, which, which John correctly outlined, and the core branding of your party. And that is, particularly if you're usually the third place party, if you vote for us, there's a clear line between more NDP MPPs in this case and more results for people. And what's the balancing act that allows that branding to come through without subsuming yourself into the into the liberal brand, um, as, as John also pointed out? And that's a very very difficult balancing act. And you know, I can say when 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 Jack and the party was making the decision in 2005 about the Paul Martin budget, uh, there were very interesting debates uh, internally. But as it turned out, um, the correct decision was made because he won more seats in every election thereafter. Uh, okay, a quick follow on that. You say the correct decision was made, but you know, Jack Layton's pulling the plug on Paul Martin eventually gave us Stephen Harper, which I can't imagine New Democrats were happy about. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of uh, um, revisionist history there. What people forget is that Jack was only able to rewrite the budget because Paul Martin had called an election on TV in April 2005. And the, the other difference between um, what, so only two weeks of parliamentary sitting were lost. The other key difference is that unlike Andrea Horvath, Jack Layton never had the balance of power in that minority parliament. He only was allowed to pass the budget because of Belinda Stronach and Chuck Cadman, and circumstances had changed by the fall. You know, I would argue, and I did argue, uh, that, you know, what, what happened in the, in the fall was when that government fell, was you actually had the most productive ends to a minority parliament in history, in that all of the opposition parties, Stephen Harper and, and Gilles Doucet included, agreed to a set of things that, that would come through. And we get Paul Martin a chance to call an election, you know, after Christmas. He decided not to. So, you know, that is one of the, the biggest urban myths out there. And, um, you know, I, don't, I think it's best that I not say more. <laughs> okay. John, let me follow up with you on the issue of the female leader. And the reason I ask that question is, you your friend Greg Lyle from British Columbia, also a, a member of the Common Sense Revolution gang once upon a time, uh, did some polling on this and found that 85% of Ontarians thought it was kind of a cool thing to have a female premier. Never had one before, obviously. So as the NDP considers whether to support the budget or not, how much do they factor that into their thinking? I think it's a, a simple one for them, actually. For them, it's, well, if you want to, if that matters to you, Andrea would make a great female premier. Harder for Tim Hood to make that argument. Right. So the, the people who the, that is going to be their deciding issue, they've got two female options. And so I don't think it, it's a big deal. Okay. Let me ask you about... I, I, I also think that as time goes on, the novelty's over. Right? Been there, done that, great. Now is the criteria purely gender? Or how about competency, how about the ability to be a good premier, or do you want to be the provincial Kim Kim? Okay. Let's ask about this grand consultation that Andrew Horvath and the NDP are taking with Ontarians. We saw that as soon as the budget was introduced, uh, Ms. Horvath came forward and said, we're not going to tell you whether we're supporting it, we're going to consult the people, we're going to do town halls, we're going to do polling, we're going to do... Um, all of the things that the leaders do in these kinds of circumstances to get a feel of where the public is at. And you participated in some of that. Sure. So tell us what you did. Well, she didn't say only new Democrats call in. So uh, from two perspectives, one, because uh, uh, being a technician, a mechanic in the business, I'd like to see how different parties are using the technology, like this opportunity to communicate with people on Twitter. Uh, secondly, I want to, and, and then see how well they're doing it, and there's something I can learn versus thing to learn not to do. So what did you actually do? Uh, well, I, the, the, I read in the newspaper that you could 
go online and fill out this questionnaire. So I went online and filled out this questionnaire and gave my honest perspective and uh, then hit the, uh, and went, do I give my name? And I went, sure, because the, the, the hook here is that all parties want you to give your name and more importantly your email address so they can loop you in for follow-up for campaign activity down the line and, and, and ask you for money. Well, but either, and also have identified either a either a supporter or a potential supporter because then you, they move you closer from the who knows who's out there to the get them to the ballot box, which obviously would include me, well at least not at this point in time. So I filled it out and then I pressed send. What happened? Nothing. And I went, great, okay. And I hit send and then I hit send. It didn't work. Well now I was a little annoyed but, and, and not being one to take no for an answer. Um, on something I'm committed to doing, I then went, looked at the article and went, there's a phone number. So then I called uh, the phone number, which was a, an IVR, an Interactive Voice Response System. And again, the, the technique of how these things are done, uh, often, uh, to my pet peeve with uh, politicians, you call the average politician's office and it's like, some staffers going, you've reached the office of, like they're, uh, you've reached Valhalla. Well, it was Andrea's voice asking all the questions. So I went, oh, good for her. Building brand, great connection, okay. But then it was interesting because depending on how the questions were worded, they, they worked differently. Well, give us an example of a question. So, so on the first question, I believe it was um, a four point, you know, do you agree with these four different policy plans? Well, I would have said yes to more than one of them on the, on the uh, uh, web version. But on the IVR, it says, if you agree with, press one. Why press one? Well, as soon as I did that, it then kicked me out so I didn't get an opportunity to even hear the other options. Uh, so if I'm looking at that and I've got the results, I'm betting that their first or second options got a lot higher response and support, which would actually be not representative necessarily of what people believe and giving them a completely false report of what people thought. So this consultation, methodologically speaking, has something to be desired. It has to be done well, and this you're suggesting was not. I'm suggesting it was less than perfect. Okay, in which case, Jamie, let me ask you, um, from the inside, that's from the outside, somebody, in this case John, trying to participate in the process that the NDP set up, from the inside, do the party officials and the leader genuinely take the feedback they get from this and other processes seriously, or is this a big public relations exercise? Um. Well, without commenting on this specific example, because uh, I'm about as far away from it as, as, as one can get, but I, th I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, I, I, can, I, I can certainly think of examples where I've been involved with, uh, where you do open things up, uh, whether it's a telephone town hall or an IVR or online stuff, and you certainly do um, incorporate the, the feedback that you get, uh, because you, you find things that you perhaps might not, uh, might not have expected. But I think the broader question here is, you know, yes, there's probably some tactical application to this, but there is this sense in minority parliaments that once the government introduces a piece of legislation, whether it's a budget or whether it's a climate bill, whatever it might be, that it's the final offer. And I think it is entirely appropriate uh, for any opposition party in a minority situation to say, no, it's not. Um, you know, it can be improved upon. Here are some suggestions in terms of how we can improve upon it. And I totally disagree with the analysis that, you know, uh, that she's being unreasonable or that she's dragging things out or all the rest of it. She has an obligation uh, to, to make policy better. And it is arrogant in the extreme uh, for a government to say this is a take it or leave it offer. I, I think we need to have a much, much more open-minded appreciation of what a minority parliament means. It means that people elected a parliament in which one party did not have control and it's incumbent on all parties uh, to do their best to make that work. And I, I think, you know, to some extent uh, she's in between the rock and a hard place. She's going into an election campaign perhaps and she's also seeking uh, people's opinion uh, to make further suggestions and I, I think that that's totally fine. Let's just remind everybody that's Jamie Heath who's joining us today from London, UK. He's a Long-time New Democrat backroom guy, uh, worked for Jack Layton in the minority parliament days of uh, the federal parliament, and John McIntyre is beside me. He's the president of the Bradgate Research Group and has uh, conservative uh, leanings and ties to the Ontario PC Party going back uh, a couple of decades.
Uh, of course, this is your opportunity to put questions to our two guests, and our first one has come in, so let's go right away on that. Uh, on transit funding, the Premier has been t uh, talking about the need for dedicated streams so that people can be sure that new taxes are actually being devoted to transit construction. Wouldn't a strong, independent, parliamentary budget officer be able to help give that assurance on general revenue streams? That's a question from Tony. It speaks, John McEtition, to an issue that the NDP have raised in the last couple of days, the last few days, I guess, uh, which is that they would like to see a kind of equivalent to the parliamentary budget officer, which we have in Ottawa, now at Queen's Park, to make sure that the expenditures were, for lack of a better expression, kosher. Do you like this idea? I love the idea, and I love that when the Conservatives wanted to bring it in nationally, and the problem is they brought it in nationally, and by and large, it's been a complete failure because the budget officer says things and the government ignores them completely and tries to cut his budget and shut them down. So it, it only works if government wants it to work and wants to cooperate and wants to listen. And having said that, if they were doing their job in the first place, then they wouldn't need a watchdog. Jamie, what do you think of this idea? And I think it's a good, I think both the dedicated uh, revenue streams and, and the oversight officer are good ideas. But to get back to, to John's point about, you know, what we have is, and it, it really doesn't matter which party we're talking about, what is a good idea in opposition is a bad idea in government. But there are instances, I'm thinking of the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, for example, where it becomes a nonpartisan benefit, where all parties agree that there is a role for this independent uh, input into budget decisions. Uh, there's something similar here in the UK. And I think that we have to, to move beyond that John described it earlier as short-term versus long-term, and say that there are some things that are of benefit uh, to government in general, and one of them is independent budget officers. I, th I think it's an entirely appropriate idea, and I think you know the the question is quite uh, quite astute because that is the the nub of the issue, and that is if you're going to bring in new revenue streams to fund transit. What guarantees do you have that they're actually going to get there? And I think a you know a parliamentary bu budget officer would be one very good way of doing it. The fear, of course, is that it's just another tax grab to bring money into general revenue and that those new revenues don't actually go towards what they were designed for. And people are people are right to be skeptical of that, are they not? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question, Tony. Let's move on to Gord. Gord's question is as follows. In my experience, there is significant difference between a spring election and a fall election. In triggering a spring election, those that caused that election suffer at the polls. It doesn't matter so much in the fall. Is that perception true? Jamie, why don't you start with that one? The spring election presumably being, you look a little too anxious to get out there, whereas in the fall there's a little more time that's passed and the public, therefore, the theory goes, won't punish whoever is the cause of the election so much. Do you believe that? Uh, I'm not certain I do. Um, you know, let's not forget there's there's more than two seasons, uh, there's four seasons, and I can think, you know, to get back to the Paul Martin Minority Parliament, uh, which is a very good example, that triggered a Christmas election campaign, and each of the parties that allegedly triggered the election that Paul Martin actually called won more seats, and the Liberals went down in seats. Um, I really don't think that the public blames uh, the party allegedly responsible for triggering an election as much as the political bubble thinks they do. I think once the election starts, then it becomes about the issues that the elections are about, and the further down the election path you get, i.e. the closer to election day, the less people are thinking about how this thing started. So, you know, with, with respect to the questioner, I don't think that it makes any difference uh, what season it's in, because I don't really think that people blame uh, the triggerer or the not trigger. I mean, if let's just say for the sake of argument that Andrea Horvath tr triggers or or puts Ontario into an election campaign that it allegedly doesn't want, is she at fault for that, or are is a bad government at fault for that? I, I'm not certain that the answer is as clear cut the as answer, the governing party would like it to be. The answer would be yes to both, and which would mean anybody that that's an issue for should then vote Conservative. <laughs> yeah, as if they have no role in, in any of this. <laughs> exactly. Here's, I, I think that what's interesting here is that it, it's been 23 years since this actually was an issue. I mean, David Peterson called an early election after j less than three years in 1990, and ever since then it's become conventional wisdom that whoever goes too soon, according to the Ontario public, whatever that means, is going to be punished. But John, there doesn't seem to be a lot of 
Besides that election, there doesn't be a lot of evidence to buttress that. No, I, I mean, I agree with you that, that what what matters more is the campaign, right? So day one, everybody's coming up with an issue. Well, if you have an issue, you use it. So an early election call is somebody's fault. That's a great story. And let's be clear, the media loves a good story, and they like to jump on that bandwagon too because it's what else are you going to say on day one? So that's a story for day one. What really then matters to whether or not it's an issue is what comes after that. And if you actually get into substantive campaign uh, policy differences or candidate, uh, take a look at BC, they, the uh, you know poor uh, conservative party out there, they've gone through four candidate firings, uh, which has basically killed that party in this election. So it's, it's what are the stories going to come every single day? And if you're the one that the finger is being pointed to on an early election, you want that to be wiped away as quickly as possible and you get your message out. So that's, it's really a function of are the campaigns being effective at getting another issue out there and getting control of the issue agenda? But just to get back to the, the to, to the David Peterson example in uh, in 1990, I guess it was 80s, 1990. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's a it's a difference. If if you have a majority government as he did, and he so clearly went uh, early then it, it, it seems that you're trying to take advantage of the situation. And I think Jean Chrétien had the same sort of thing in 1997 when he called the election during the Manitoba floods for no ostensible reason. And, you know, I, the timing of the election in a majority situation, I think, is quite different than a minority situation, although I completely agree that I think David Peterson uh, certainly suffered uh, for that precipitous call. There, there were also a couple of other reasons, the Patty Starr and, uh, you know, it, you know, allegations of corruption, right? So the motivations of a government, right? If, you, if you're trying to avoid... Uh, debate in the House and you want to get to an election to try to refresh the page and get a new mandate before you get investigated, that's a little different. Like in, like in Ottawa, if they could control the whole Gomery inquiry and had to go away for a couple more years, that would have affected election timing too. So the yeah, ability to control these things, is a, it, these outside things, is, is part of the calculus. I think the bottom line here I mean, is that yeah. if you look like Sorry. you are calling an election for your benefit, as opposed to for some public interest, you'll be punished for that. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, yes, if you have a majority parliament. You know, I think a minority situation is quite different, because I think, A, the, the so-called blame for an election is, uh, it, it's much more difficult to determine, uh, and, and B, I'm not certain that, you know, the reason that people elected a minority parliament in the first place is they did not want to have one party in charge. And I, I'm not certain that people are as uh, reluctant to vote, which after all is a fairly important aspect of a democracy, than the, the pundits seem to think that they are. I, I, you know, words like plunged into an election or thrown into an election, it's as if an election is a bad thing, and I'm not certain that people think it is. I, I, and I, to go to motive with Andrea specifically, uh, Tim Hudak has, you know, he's made it clear he's voting against anything that ever comes up. So he's handed all the decision making uh, powers, the parliament, to the government and to Andrea. For her, uh, if we believe, and one believes the polls of the moment because they're the ones that are in the papers, uh, she would, the net effect would be right now that she'd still be third place party. She'd only gain a uh, half dozen seats, maybe. So if that's the case, certainly that's not, there's zero self interest from her based on what's out there publicly right now in calling an election. If she maintained the government and supported the budget, there's more self-interest there. Let me do, John, a follow-up with you on this because I've had a number of questions from the public about this and, and I've, I've talked to Tim Hudak about it and I'm still not sure what the answer is. When Kathleen Wynne got chosen the Liberal leader back in January, and started to move the party further to the left in order to secure NDP support on her program. She vacated a bit of the middle. Mm -hmm. And Tim Hudak has clearly planted his flag over on the right. I mean, the, all of the dozen white papers that he's introduced, uh, the discussion papers, have been, I think by Ontario standards, very small C conservative policy, which you would like, I'm sure. Having said that, there's now a bit more room in the middle to play with if the Conservatives wanted to move into the middle to broaden that tent. And yet, Hudak has done two things. He has not moved into the middle quite purposefully, and he has been a big no on everything having to do with any votes in this House. Not supporting the budget, not supporting the throne speech. 
as you point out, giving Andrew Horvath final say basically on whether the House survives. Why is he doing that? Uh, I think he's um, representing his base. Recording. Still, still half from the last election. He's a half a million vote shy of where Mike Harris uh, ended his his reign. So, um, looking around, where you're going to get votes? You know, do you go to the left and try to you know fight for a hundred thousand votes of disaffected liberal votes, um, or do you stay true to your core and build upon that and go after your own theoretical supporters who just haven't participated lately? And, and, and I actually think that if, if this election was held today, uh, the wild dynamic would be less people voting than ever before, uh, with potentially Tim losing 100,000 more votes. I think that the Liberals would lose potentially 200,000 votes, which would mean they would actually then tie the Conservatives, because they were 100,000 ahead in the last election. And the NDP are the only party for, I believe, the last four elections have grown. And under Andrea, I think you'd see stellar growth. So this could be a three-way dogfight come election day. And uh, in the left-right thing, I mean, um, it's not a campaign yet. So the most important thing for any of the parties right now is building your core support, raising money. They all have debts. Getting your teams ready. So you want the activists to be engaged. There's a whole campaign to court the... The, the softer edges of, of your party support. So I, I would not be surprised to see Tim uh, much more there during a general campaign. Um, and, and you're right about uh, the Premier. The Premier has, uh, I'd argue, gone so far left that, uh, uh, and Andrea is being, uh, at least on the fiscal stage, being so small C conservative, that they may be pa in the process of passing each other so that the moderate middle party, uh, so, so to speak, might be the NDP. Well, that, that happened back in the day in, in the Ontario Parliament when Bill Davis was Premier, and the, the Liberals actually ran frequently to the right of Bill Davis back then. Jamie, you wanted to say? I, I did want to say, and I don't disagree with anything that you, you've said, and I don't think there's anything uh, particularly unusual about the NDP perhaps being a, a party of, the, uh, of moderation, because that certainly is true in Western Canada. But, but I think that, particularly in Toronto, there is this the sort of the the first instinct in analyzing politics is left and right and and middle, and I think that is certainly part of it. the The danger that the NDP has is that they also trade votes with uh, conservatives, and they're not left right votes; they are populist votes and they're anti establishment votes. So when you look at for for instance, when, when Preston Manning swept uh, the West, he won a lot of NDP seats uh, previously. And I think in, in downtown Toronto, there's a bit of a blind spot to that, that populist, anti-establishment uh, vote that can manifest itself in a whole bunch of issues. And on that front, the NDP and the Conservatives are the ones who are in competition with each other. And it is a much more difficult balancing act um, for, the, for the NDP in this case. Because if there's one party that will not get the populist votes, uh, I think it's probably safe to say that it's the Liberals. Gotcha. Okay, we have another question in now. This is from either a place named Fargo or a person named Fargo. It just says Fargo. It says, I haven't read anything about McGinty's, Dalton McGinty's testimony regarding the gas plants. Can you summarize what he said or more likely didn't say? Okay, uh, for those that don't know, it is a pretty rare day in the province of Ontario when a premier or former premier is asked to come before a task force or a committee of the legislature or a royal commission and testify about decisions made. Mike Harris had to do it with regard to the water scandal in Walkerton where people died. Uh, George Drew, I think, had to do it back in the 1940s on some labor issues. Uh, and Dalton McGinty. Park last week and testify about how he decided to cancel the Mississauga gas plant in the dying days of the 2000s and 11 uh, Ontario election campaign and the short answer was it's never to in his view it's never too late to make the right decision uh, he saw a scenario whereby all three parties liberals conservatives and democrats all wanted that plant cancelled they all wanted it moved he claims he did not understand how much it would cost to move the plant we've now discovered that Ontarians are going to pay for two plants and really only get one and I don't know, did you see his testimony, John? Or no. You heard about it? That yeah, I read. The, um, the suggestion was that the decision, the suggestion he made was that the decision was made strictly on the merits 
that this was a a timely decision with all three parties agreeing to it made because the reality was that plant shouldn't have been sited in that place. And, Kathleen, they, want, and they wanted to win two seats. And well, and, and Kathleen Wynne has subsequently come out and said, let's get real. There were some there were some politics behind that decision. She says she didn't have anything to do with it, even though she was co-chair of the campaign, that it was a Dalton McGinty and Don Guy, his campaign director, decision. You've been in the back rooms. What's going on here? Um, you know, as someone who is a, a professional mechanic in the game, as a political consultant and public opinion researcher, um, I, I always uh, shake my head when various interests don't like the, the paid advisors uh, under whatever campaign app. At the end of the day, one person makes a decision. The Premier. The Premier. And the Premier picks the cabinet. The Premier makes the policy decisions, picks the campaign plan. And certainly who you pick is a, a factor and a filter in all of that. But at the end of the day, it's real clear. We still have a system that's basically the last vestige of kingdom, right? If you elect a, a, a prime minister or a premier, and they're the king, they or queen, or queen, as we have now, and they make the decision. And and at the end of the day, they can go out and say, "What do you think?" But it comes back to who makes the decision. Uh, you like to use Bill Davis stories, so I'll give you one. Um, uh, doesn't matter what the policy was, but I remember the tale. Of, he would go around and there'd be always healthy debates among his cabinet because he had a very colorful cabinets. And at the end of the day, um, there'd be this often this great division, and he would announce what consensus was. <laughs> the boss gets to do that. That's yeah. right. Jamie, let me tap into your experience on this by asking the following. Kathleen Wynne was the co-chair of the last Liberal Ontario general election campaign. And as a result, she would have been out campaigning a lot, she would have been out on the hustings, she would have been sometimes in her riding, but more often than not in other ridings as a uh, high-profile cabinet minister trying to help others win their seats as well. She yes. insists she had nothing to do with the gas plant decision. Is it reasonable to assume that a co-chair on a big decision like that during the writ period didn't have anything to do with that decision? Oh, I, I can envision myself getting into trouble with this answer, but I think the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, co-chairs, and I, I don't speak for, for the Liberal Party in any way on this, but in my experience within the NDP, the co-chairs of the campaign are predominantly involved in the, the pre-campaign period. So they, they oversee the platform formulation, for example, they make sure that fundraising is going on, but once the campaign begins, um, it's not to say that they're figureheads. They're not figureheads, but they're not in in day-to-day -day control of the campaign uh, in the way that, say, your campaign manager uh, or campaign director would be. So I think, you know, on the face of it, it it probably is it is plausible. What is not plausible, though, just to pick up on the previous conversation, is the sense that because there happened to be agreement among all three parties in the legislature that the gas plant wasn't located in a good place, that the party which had the obvious access to the information is somehow off the hook for making the decision that the other two parties without the information agreed with. I think that is that is absolutely silly uh, logic and they shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Gotcha. Okay, we have time for one more question and it's from James and here we go. He says, I love seeing parties work together in a minority parliament. In my view, this is a very healthy situation for democracy. Do your guests feel that the parties are making the most of cooperating? The PC party in particular really seems to have made a tactical blunder in disengaging from the budget process. John, I should get you to comment on this first, but this is something that we heard over and over again a year ago. Said, go to the throne speech before reading it, no to the budget before reading it. He's done the same thing this time. Does the disengagement, as this person puts it, have a price uh, attached to it? Uh, so let me make it clear that uh, a, a good leader surrounds himself with a variety of people that will give them competing advice. And that's part of the, the healthy process of uh, letting a leader uh, make the best decision. And that being said, I'm, I'm not part of uh, Tim Budak's uh, inner circle or, or close advisors in any way. And uh, so I say that because, as a, again, as an observer, not as far away, um, but uh, the reality for me was it was a mistake a year ago, and it's a mistake now. 
to disengage, to disengage, because basically for the entire budgetary uh, media discussion, the conservatives and Tim Hudak have only showed up in the last paragraph as a, and they're committed to saying no, no matter what. And that's lasted about a month. Hey, it was three months last, last time. Yeah. So for me, it's like, I, I would, rat, uh, I think the way Andrea's been doing it is the best way. Uh, I think Tim should have been out there saying uh, publicly, uh, everybody would know he's going to vote against it. That would not have been a surprise. But he could have used the opportunity to say, here's my shopping list. Here's the six things I think are important. And if he came up with all of these things, because it's what I and my party believe in, then he would have given his platform more media play and been part of the discussion. As it was all last year and this year, the budget discussions have been between the Liberal and the NDP every day. That's the only discussion. Well, and the irony of that, Jamie, is that, of course, the result, because the Liberals have to play ball with the NDP, is that policies get introduced that are even further away from what the Conservatives would like to see at the end of the day. But as John just told us, Tim Hudak and his team feel they need to stay true to their base, and any playing footsie with the Liberals at all would harm that. What would your advice be in these circumstances? Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Um, I mean, I think there's two ways to look at this. One of them is is from a position of tactics, and I think that um, that, that John is probably correct. Uh, the effect of what Tim Hudak has done is give uh, Andrew Horvath more media space and diminish his own. But to get back to what the questioner asked, which is what do the voters want? And I, I totally agree with the questioner. I think the voters uh, partly elect minority parliaments because they don't want anyone in charge, but they also partly elect minority parliaments because they want kind of everyone in charge. And if we had a circumstance, for example, that's in place in New Zealand, which, which only ever has minority parliaments because it has a PR system, you don't have this sort of Damocles effect that we do in Ontario or in Ottawa. So let's imagine a situation where there wasn't going to be an election. And the only way the budget was going to pass the House is if they make it good enough that it gets enough votes. But nobody can bring the government down. Then I think you would have a very, very different dynamic. You'd have a dynamic that was much more cooperative and much less about tomorrow's newspaper. And I think that, that Tim Hudak would find that he'd be able to get things in the budget. I think Andrea Horvath certainly would as well. But I think you'd also have a public that looked at, at Queen's Park and said, you know, they're actually working for me as opposed to they're only out for what's in their partisan benefit. And just to get back to the, the core dilemma that, that the NDP is facing, you know, Jack Layton had a history of cooperation in each of the minority parliaments that he was a part of, both in the budget but also with the failed coalition. And even though he was highly exposed to being sort of sucked into the liberal brand which punished uh, Bob Ray with David Peterson, he won more votes and more seats in every election that he was leader. And I think a, a large part of that, not all of it certainly, but a large part of it uh, was because he consistently showed uh, that he would get things done and people responded. So cooperation works. Well, it, it, yes. let me say there's also a, a solid position. I didn't agree with the policy, uh, but there's a solid reason for it too. And that would be if you know that you can't uh, you know, a conservative party can't steal the left flank from a liberal party and you want a strong uh, person out there so the liberals have to face a two-front war in the next election, then there's an opportunity to do everything you can without appearing partisan to leave all, all the space to that person and make them strong so that it becomes many, uh, many writings will be much, in the next election I believe there'll be much closer three-way fights and that the every vote, every seat that's lost to the NDP from the Liberals is also one more seat closer for Tim Hudak if he's in second place to winning as well. Gentlemen, good discussion. Uh, I look at the clock and our time is up. Jamie, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day and across the pond to join us today. I hope you're doing well. No, no, my pleasure. And it's great to see you again. And John McEtition, thank you for making the drive in all the way from Dundas, Ontario, which we now call Hamilton, Ontario. No, you don't. No, well, you don't, but I do. And uh, we appreciate you coming all the way to TVO to, uh, today to do this as well. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back in two weeks' time for another edition of our Queen's Park check-in as we take your questions and consider uh, the state of play at the Ontario Legislature. Uh, 
uh, we can imagine that two weeks from now we may have more answers to the questions that we have been discussing today. It's a very fascinating time at the potential legislature these days. So stay tuned. And I should also add, Premier Kathleen Wynne will be on the agenda tomorrow night, 8 and 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and uh, no doubt some of the questions you asked today will factor into our conversation. Jamie, John, thanks a lot for this. And to our online viewers, until next